Hello, my name is Lee Moroni, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Storybook Marketing, which is a brand and demand agency. And today I'm here to talk to you about how brand marketing is a critical lever to growth marketing. For a little bit of background, I spent my entire career in the SaaS space as a demand generation marketer. And a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today has been through the learnings that I've had and what I'm seeing in programs today, especially as demand is getting harder and harder to source in SaaS programs. So I want to start by just talking about the brand problem. So from the perspective that I see in so many clients that we work with, there is a brand gap in modern programs. And what I mean by that is we're spending so much of our time and budget, as I'll talk about, focus very much on demand generation. And demand generation depends on brand marketing to be really successful. It feeds off of brand awareness. And I'm going to talk through how that shapes itself and what that actually looks like in an effective program. And really where I'm starting from is that most of our time today in B2B SaaS and in demand gen comes through the lens of trying to convince people to engage with us, to consume content from us, ultimately to choose us as an option. But one of the critical things that we miss is that that's not actually how people choose brands. It's not done through convincing. It's not done through consumption. It's done through consideration sets. And that happens from a brand position first. So ultimately, we have a brand marketing problem. And I don't need to tell you this, this is a cliche at this point, but the current B2B marketing playbook is broken. There are a lot of things that make brand marketing really difficult because as marketers, we love the idea of building brands. It's not that any of us lack the desire to do so. There's a lot of things that make it really difficult to actually invest in long-term brand thinking. Examples that you're going to be very familiar with are that we have a very conversion-focused mindset. We think through the lens of lead generation and clicks and calls to actions and form fills, and we have very short-sighted measurements. We tend to think in the near term. Demand generation rightfully does think about pipeline, and pipeline often has very near-term objectives. Those targets are always looming, and they always end up winning. The other parts is that we have very direct attribution expectations, and that's simply not how brand works, unfortunately. We think in terms of this channel had X dollars in and X dollars out, and we try and attribute as directly as possible, which often pits channels against each other. And all of this is underpinned by a lack of brand awareness. Now, brand awareness, as I'm going to talk about, is more than just oh, hey, I recognize your logo, there's a lot more to it when you dig into the theory and a lack of brand awareness sets up demand generation for failure. John Miller, the original co-founder of Marketo, has said this a few times where the best demand generation cannot overcome a brand problem. And that's ultimately what I'm here to talk about. And all of this is reinforced by the fact that this is not even how people choose brands. And so that's where I want to start with, is really understanding that we think through the lens of demand gen and we're held to a very measurement pressure, but there's some other parts of it too, which is the way we assemble the journeys, the way we think through how to get people to convince themselves to choose us, how to get into their consideration sets, and a lot of it is misaligned to the way that brand selection actually happens. For example, when you look at the journeys that we often assemble, particularly from a content perspective, we tend to assemble it in a very linear fashion. So what that means is that we think there's a starting point and then we're trying to get them to an ending point. And often that starts in places like, we assume you don't know that you have a problem and we're going to educate you on that problem. And once we've shown you the problem, we're gonna move you into being solution aware. We're gonna tell you how we can solve that problem. And then we're gonna tell you why we're the best option to solve that problem. And then ultimately we're gonna move you into a place where you're ready to talk to us and to be sales ready. And when you see the dividing line in the middle here, a lot of the content that happens at that early stage first and foremost, doesn't mention the product very often. We do very top of funnel, middle of funnel content where we talk about the category, we talk about the problem statements, and then we somehow have a very jarring switch into product marketing. And so we end up with this journey that firstly is very disjointed where it goes from thought leadership into product marketing very aggressively, and that often doesn't result in a very good buyer experience. But more importantly, 
the way we've assembled it is in this linear fashion where they're starting from a place of zero and we're getting them to a place of one, which means choosing us. And that's not how buying selection actually works. So let's talk about how it does actually shape together. So the way people choose brands, you've often heard of the consideration set. Now, the consideration set is a lot more complicated than the Gartner Quadrant and who industry analysts say are the consideration sets. In reality, B2B buyers and all buyers are making mental lists well below they actually, before they need to actually buy a product, before they're in the place where they're buyer ready. You've heard this 95-5 rule where only 5% of the market is actually buying at any given time. Well, the 95% are still consuming information, which is in farming lists that they will someday use to decide who they want to actually purchase. I want to talk through some data that really supports this. Ultimately, what it comes down to is the brands who are thought of and the ones who are top of mind, the ones who come to mind are the ones who end up winning. And there's some data that came out recently from Pavilion, who did a survey alongside Trust Radius. And here's some stats from it that really drive this home. 86% of all enterprise buyers shortlisted products that they had known about well before they started doing their research process. So in other words, before they became buyer ready, before all of those intense signals showed up, before they come in market, they had already assembled a list. And that list was people who had been in their minds long before that process started. So it shows that if you're not already known to those buyers before they're ready and before they have a, an acute pain to solve it, there's a very good chance you're not going to get into that list because it's it's essentially too late. What's even more damning is of that list, 71% of buyers picked the one that was their original top choice. So when we have these conquesting campaigns, when we're trying to get in and find our way into an RFP that didn't include us, the data shows that if you weren't in that list early, A, you're not getting into that list by all accounts, and B, the ones who were in the list at the start were the ones who won anyway. So even if you get in as a late contender, the odds are the one they were thinking of first is the one they're going to pick. This is the impact of brand, where the demand cannot be moved away. It's very, very difficult to convince people out of a decision they made long, long ago. And another version of this is from the same survey shows that the ones who get selected, the brands who are thought of two thirds of the time are ones that are established, that are leading. In other words, well-known brands who are generally seen to be the leaders. This is the reality of B2B purchasing. There's a lot of risk in picking vendors and buyers often pick the ones that feel the less risky, even if they may not be the best option, if they feel like they're established, they've been around for a long time, you hear about them all the time, the ones who are known are the ones who end up getting selected. And the last bit that's important here is that when they looked across all of the brands that they surveyed in this, all the B2B brands, 38% was the average amount of spend that was being allocated towards brand awareness. In a lot of cases, it was much, much lower. The vast majority of the budget was going towards demand generation, was going towards lead generation, was going towards conversion-focused efforts. And so there's a mismatch. What the industry is facing is a brand awareness problem, and our budgets are skewed away from that. So most brands are not trying to solve that, which is both a bad thing, but it's also a big opportunity for anyone who is looking to take advantage of this situation. So just bringing it back to demand, I want to talk about what demand looks like as it goes through a couple of motions of brand awareness. Because like I mentioned, brand awareness is more than just, I recognize who you are. It's actually quite a big spectrum. It starts there. So you see on the left-hand side, brand recognition is essentially what a lot of us think of as brand awareness. It's if you see my logo, you recognize it. Oh, I know who you are. I've seen you around. That's brand recognition at the basic level. It obviously doesn't necessarily mean they know what you do, which is where you start to shift a little bit farther into the second column, where now we're thinking of you in terms of, I recognize you, and if you ask me what you do, I can tell you. I've got a good sense of what you do as a company. This is generally what's known as 
aided brand awareness. So if I give you the prompt and say, hey, have you ever heard of this company or have you ever seen this logo? You can say, yes, absolutely. Now, from a demand generation perspective, this does not generally result in inbounds because people need to be prompted about you. They know you, but they don't think of you. That's where the difference comes in. So from a program perspective, it's still a very valuable thing to be recognized and understood, even if it takes prompting, because that's where things like outbound can be very effective. That's where advertising can be effective because you're nudging people. When it shifts into the second category, what's known as brand salience, this is where that awareness is now top of mind. So they don't need to be prompted. If someone says, who solves this problem? The buyer goes, this brand. That's unaided brand awareness, brand recall. That's where it starts to shift into people having a problem, thinking of you in conjunction with that problem, and then coming to you to solve that problem. That's the power of brand awareness. It's far more than just recognition. It's actually thinking of you. And there's a lot of data out there outside of the B2B industry that really reinforces this. The chart that you're looking at here comes from a source from the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising from two very famous people called Les and Banesh, who talked about the impact of what's known as sales activation, which we would call demand gen and brand building. The yellow on this chart shows that when you do sales activation, conversion type focusing, near-term pipeline gen activities, you do see spikes because it's very efficient, it's very effective, but that spike goes down very quickly and then goes away. So when you're not heavily promoting, you tend not to be seeing any impact. But brand building, on the other hand, complements that and builds and builds and compounds over time, making all of those effectiveness issues more prominent, you get more results from them. So brand and demand complement one another. They're not in com competition. They're not the same thing. Brand awareness helps demand gen work better. So what actually creates salience? And this is what I want to talk about. There's a couple of theories out there that have come from a few institutes that you may or may not have heard of called the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. LinkedIn is getting on this as well, where those two terms are becoming very popular. One is what's known as mental availability, which is not the same as brand awareness, but it's much more like that brand salience that I talked about. It's the probability that a buyer will think of you when they have a problem. So brand awareness is a good goal. Mental availability is a very, very valuable one because it's what will bump you up in the list. It's what will make people go, I have a problem. I know who solves it. I will go and talk to them. That's the goal of brand marketing. And the way you achieve that is the second box, which is what are known as category entry points. These are all brand new terms to a lot of people, but the easiest way to think of a category entry point is simply, what are the things that trigger you to think of needing a solution? So when someone has a problem, when your buyer has their problem that they're solving, what things prompt them to go, I need to get this solved? Sometimes they are external issues. There might be changes in the environment. Their demand might drop. Their results might go down. They might have internal things. They may Maybe you've bought a new piece of technology, and now you have a new problem. Maybe you've hired a team, and you're expanding, and that opens up the door to the problem that you solve. The key is understanding when are the moments that the pain of their problem will cause them to go, I need to solve this, who solves this? And when you market into those, that's what creates mental availability. Now, from a content point of view, there's a few ways this takes shape. Most of what you see here in the white is what we very often already market to in B2B SaaS, where at the bottom, we're talking about product marketing, where we're talking about our features, our functionalities. To the top end of that in the white is the product category, where we're often talking about buyer's guides and how to select a vendor and things like that. But above that is where all of that mental availability gets developed. It's where you're talking about the problem, not the solution, but the problem itself. So addressing what the bigger issue is that your audience actually is dealing with. And the other angle is what's your product's view on that problem? How do you think about solving that problem? That's what allows you to introduce your product into that conversation. This is where brand marketing content takes shape. 
And it's in addition to the regular content you're producing. It's not in replacement of it because you do still need to convert people. You do still need to provide that sales enablement material. This is what helps just add that extra brand layer on top. So there's a lot in here. And I want to just summarize what I went through because Ultimately, we do have a brand marketing problem. You see this in report after report, and sales teams articulate this really well, where you ask them why the deal didn't go through or why the meeting went bad, and they'll often tell you, well, we were too late in the game. They were already an RFP. They'd already selected a vendor. We were late. All of these are symptoms of being outside of the consideration set, which is ultimately a brand problem. So it's important to understand that we don't control that journey. Our job is to be part of it, is to find ourselves associated to it. So brands don't get selected through this linear journey. It exists. They're going through the motions of solving the problem themselves. Our job is to try and make sure that we are understanding that journey and attaching ourselves to those category entry points being associated with us. So the linear path of your problem unaware, your solution unaware, you're in a consideration phase is not the reality of the journey. It's much more market to the problem, market to the category entry points, and create memory structures. Consideration sets are developed through those memory structures and it takes place long before they need it. So if you're marketing only to people exhibiting intent signals, you're probably way too late in the game. So the goal is to develop a map for your content to those category entry points. Understand them, talk into them, reinforce them, and continue to refresh them. But also don't be afraid to talk through the lens of your product. We're often very afraid to mention our product until we've gotten someone farther into a journey. But if they don't know what you do, and if they don't know how your product thinks about solving their problem, you won't get into their consideration set. Top of funnel content that doesn't involve your product worldview doesn't often create those associations. And focus on consumption of that content. Unlike some of the other content, the goal is not to convert. The goal is to create memories. And ultimately, those memory structures are better than the lead lists that you're going to build over time, because that's what gets you remembered. That's what places you top of mind. We have a brand problem, and this is how we solve it.